great. I think it won't fit unless you have USB-C. Okay, so we will continue with the talk by Linka Carr from Colorado School of Mind, and Linka will tell us about quantum soliton surprise or surprises. <laughs> yes, I had to modify my talk with uh, one additional letter. I hope no one minds. So, okay, uh, I'm very excited to present this work. Uh, some of you I've known for many years, I think. Mark, you first introduced me to dispersive shock waves back in Boulder when you were perhaps a PhD student at the time. I'm trying to recall. It was a long time ago. I got very excited about the subject. I thought about it for many years. I'm going to talk today about solitons, and I think that will set the stage for dispersive shock waves in entangled quantum systems. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, I'll reference a little bit of work with Mark Oblovitz, but a lot of this will be about my work with Masito Ueda and Rina Kanemoto and the Google Quantum AI team using Google's quantum computer. So, all right, so let's talk about the quantumness scale for solitons. Uh, so we can start by thinking about what we've covered in this workshop. In this workshop, we focused on what we will call mean field solitons. Um, we can talk about effective mean field theory, uh, which sometimes in the uh, optics community gets called incoherent solitons, that is averaging over many modes. Uh, we can talk about the quantum fluctuations supporting the mean field, which looks like higher order nonlinearity, as I'll show you, and should be familiar to this audience. We can talk about strongly interacting solutions limiting to solitons, and I didn't see anything about that here, although some of you may be aware of this area, but I'd like to show it to you. Uh, probably you've heard of um, squeeze states or non-classical states used to make solitons even back in the 90s. This is an ongoing field uh, towards schrodinger cats. Uh, and then we could talk about quantum correlated bright solitons, which is really the cutting edge of research in both condensates right now. And then finally, what are we doing with solitons on quantum computers? Well, I'll show you some preliminary work in this direction with Goldilocks quantum cellular automata. So uh, in 30 minutes, I can't cover everything, but I'll try to hit a few of these topics with some overview slides, and then I'll take questions and be around if people would like to discuss research directions. At the end of this talk, I plan to suggest some open mathematical problems for the audience, which I hope you will find interesting. So to remind you, uh, bright solitons were first observed in 2002 in Paris. I was a postdoc in this group at the time. It was very exciting. And shortly thereafter, bright soliton trains were observed at Rice. These are mean field solitons. Now, although this was originally done in 2002 in Bose condensates, it's an ongoing field. Here's some of my most recent work on mean field solitons with Mark Oblovitz, showing that the entire story of integrability extends into the fractional KDV and the fractional, uh, the fractional nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And the only real difference is that the soliton has a different velocity, and the velocity depends on the order of the fractional derivative. We also worked out the uh, fractional oblivitz lattic equation. And you may very much like to look at those papers. I had great fun with them, and I hope that they will inspire you. Of course, one can immediately ask, is there a DSW solution of the fractional NLS and fractional KDV? And I think there must be. And so that's a nice open problem. And see, so uh, I'm already keeping my promise on my second slide to provide some open mathematical problems. OK. So now what about higher dimensions? Well, solitons and vortices in Bose condensates exist in a very different environment than, for example, in optics. They're very 3D. Here's the first observation of a dark soliton done at NIST. This is the experiment. This is the theory. I think it's a rubidium cloud. You can see the soliton is a big notch driven in the middle. It runs down to the edge uh, through a varying density and then turns into a couple of vortices on the end and, and breaks up. Um, there was a very nice uh, picture shown earlier in this meeting by Peter Engels, who's, I think, made a, a lifetime habit of producing the most beautiful soliton pictures on Earth in Bose condensates. And here's a nice early example of Kachenko oscillations in a vortex lattice, very much an ongoing field. Um, and so I would highly recommend you have a look at Peter's work if you didn't have a chance to attend his talk. I believe that was on Monday. Now, bright solitons and higher dimensions in general implode, right? I think we all know this as mathematicians um, due to these sorts of bounds, right? And so for Bose condensates, this gets called the Bose Nova. Now, it happens that you can stop this implosion with dipole-dipole interactions. 
Okay, and so I have a little viewpoint from 2016 where this was first accomplished. Dipole-dipole interactions will stabilize bright solitons in higher dimensions. It's nothing more than a, than a non-local nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And in fact, if you want to describe it mathematically, it's quite pretty. It goes under the name of droplet crystals, um, for example, in dysprosin BECs. And here's the original description from an observation from 2016. And you can see that what happens is you get this sort of uh, lattice or pattern formation of droplets that makes this crystal. Um, and here's the number uh, of droplets as a function of the number of atoms in experiments. And then the mathematical description is straightforward. Here is the non-local nonlinear Schrodinger equation with some sort of non-local potential. In general now, people look at all sorts of power laws, not only an inverse cube. Uh, and then you have um, this uh, LHY quantum fluctuation effective potential. And this is an example of something that's beyond mean field. It's still described by a nonlinear wave equation, still an effective fluid dynamics, but it is beyond the mean field discussed in the rest of this meeting. However, in side discussions, I noticed that a number of people are, were aware of this. That's great. There, there are many open problems in this area. You know, essentially, you, know, you, you have psi to some half integer higher order power, and you have to include that in the equation and solve that problem. So there's a nice set of problems there. I imagine, for example, the universality that was just described in the very nice talk before mine should also appear in this equation in the DSW solution. OK, so let's get more quantum. So now let's think about the Lieb-Linegar Hamiltonian. The Lieb-Linegar Hamiltonian is what happens when you have atoms interacting on a ring. They have a contact interaction. Here's their dispersion. And then you allow this ring to be in some rotating frame. Okay. And uh, so uh, you can Fourier transform this to the angular momentum basis, and then this becomes your Hamiltonian. And you see there is my hopping right between angular momentum states, and here's my interaction and my conservation law in angular momentum. I can solve this problem in a Fox space subject to two conservation laws that the total number of atoms is conserved and the total angular momentum is conserved. So now I often give a whole hour talk on this subject because I spent some three years of my life on it, but I'm just going to show you one result in one slide. And this in particular references a concept that I first saw introduced by Michael Berry, I think in an interview, um, and it's called the quantum flesh sewn on the classical bones. And the idea is that when you look at the density of states, um, these are the energies uh, for some uh, you know, fixed number of atoms for different angular momentum states uh, for some fixed interaction. As, as a function of the rotation on the ring. You know, if you zoom in on these dark regions, you can recover the classical solutions, in this case, the solitons. Here is the soliton, okay? It's right there. And in fact, you get it by taking the extrema of the derivative of the energy with respect to the angular momentum setting that equal to zero. So there's some nice papers on that and uh, in a book chapter. And those kinds of solutions connect continuously to the well-known bright solitons that have been brought up in this meeting many times extending into the quantum regime. So if you want to know where is the, you know, the bright soliton in the many body problem, it's right there. It's the quantum, it's the, uh, it's the classical bone under the quantum flesh. However, uh, with respect to uh, Michael's very nice concept, there are things that are beyond this and because of quantum computers, we're able to get access to them now. So I want to talk about that. And in order to talk about that, I'd like to introduce quantum cellular automata. Okay, now probably most of you have heard of um, Conway's Game of Life or played around with it. And so to remind you, um, if I want to make something like that, you know, I need to mock up a Hamiltonian because these are quantum simulators. And this is a, a spin flip, although I put it in particle language. Um, on the block sphere for a qubit, it would flip the bit from the top pole to the bottom pole is all it would do. It would be the X operator. In particle language, it's a destruction plus a creation operator. And, uh, and so that um, spin flip uh, depends on this neighborhood condition, that there are either two or three spin-ups in a neighborhood of five sites. Okay, so that's the idea. And so if you run that condition and you start with um, you know, one, zero, one, you will find that there is some kind of localized solution that continues in time when you evolve this Hamiltonian. And how am I solving this Hamiltonian? I'm solving it very simply by exact diagonalization. Any undergraduate can solve this problem. Okay. Um, and so that's very much like Conway's Game of Life. In fact, if, if, if you go back and you look at Conway's Game of Life, which also involves a kind of a neighborhood of similar size, you'll find that there are these sort of discrete solitons that are made um, that are called gliders. And my colleague Mark Oblowitz in a series of papers in the 90s studied them as solitons. I think he called them digital solitons at the time. Right. Now you can ask, what's going on with the entropy? For those of you that are concerned about quantum systems and whether they're low or high entropy, whether you can simulate them or not, 
this is the entropy over the maximum entropy. You can see that, you know, as a function of the number of sites that I include here, in fact, the entropy is pretty big. It's not maximal, but it's large. That means it's not easily classically simulatable, but it's large enough to be interesting, but it's not so large that it's, you know, it's turning into a random state or a volume state. Okay. So now to remind you about cellular automata, or perhaps you haven't heard this before, um, there's a very nice book by Downey called Think Complexity that I think is a great way to learn about cellular automata. It has nice Python codes you can run through. And so he sort of goes through the four kinds of elementary cellular automata in 1D. So I'm going to go back down to just nearest neighbor rules. I look to the right and I look to the left and I do something based on the condition of the bits to right and left. And so the minimal dimension rule would be, for example, rule 56, which just, you know, if I flip a bit, it just propagates upward in time. I'd call that a one-dimensional rule. Um, you know, a maximal dimensional rule, also a simple one, is a random number generator, so-called rule 30. You flip a bit, and it makes a pseudo-random pattern. Uh, rule 90 happens to have a fractal dimension of 1.59. And so we see already there are three very different kinds of rules dimensionally in elementary cellular automata. And in fact, uh, one of them is also Turing complete. And so we sometimes call that a, a complex rule or complexity generating rule. So we can think about those four kinds of rules. This is well-known textbook material. And I'd like to now talk about the quantum generalization that we realized on Google's quantum computer. OK. So the first thing you do is you replace the bits with quantum bits, which are little spheres. And I remind you that there are two angles between 0 and 1. It is nothing more than that. Um, and then we replace our transition function, the idea that you know, a bit flips or doesn't flip depending on the states of its neighbors to what's called a double controlled unitary gate. I rotate somewhere on the block sphere depending on the condition of the neighbors. And in particular, I'll be interested in what I would call a spin balance condition from, this, from the physics perspective, which is a 1, 0, or a 0, 1, something like that. Okay. So, and then finally, uh, for classical bits, you can do a simultaneous global update. Uh, you have a, a chain of bits, and, and you, can, you can update them all at once. Right? Quantum mechanically, if you update a bit over here, things are entangled, so this bit knows about this. Right? There was just a Nobel Prize on this subject recently, I think. Yeah? So uh, you know, we have to actually choose a time ordering. The results I show you will not de actually depend on the time ordering. It's one of the significant aspects of the results. But quantum mechanics is time ordered. And for pedagogy, I'll show you even odd site circuit layers in this case. OK, so these will be Goldilocks quantum cellular automata, which are ones that are balanced. If you don't know the story of Goldilocks, you know Goldilocks was concerned about porridge being too hot or too cold, chairs being too big or too small, beds being too large or too small, or too hard or too soft. And in general, Goldilocks liked the answer in the middle. So quantum cellular automata are just like Goldilocks. Okay. And so mathematically, what does this look like? I'm doing very little math here because it's too much for me to do in half an hour. I'm a bit embarrassed not to have more equations for a math conference. But there's a lot of pretty math under here. Um, in th this is your uh, local unitary, and your local unitary, you take a product between these projections onto the states of the neighbors. That's actually how it works. And then you encode that into a quantum circuit. OK, so there are 16 reversible rules. Now, why am I doing reversible rules? The answer is open system quantum mechanics is still an open problem. When the system itself is entangled and it's interacting with an environment, that's an unsolved problem in general. You can use approximations. but that's still uh, not solvable totally in quantum computers, but reversible things are solvable. That's called closed quantum system quantum mechanics, just to remind you. And so of those you know, 256 elementary cellular automata rules, 16 are reversible. And two of them are quite trivial, 0 and 15. Okay. Uh, T13 is an example where you know, there's high activity and broken symmetry, but it really doesn't do anything physically interesting. T1 happens to be a rule that's already seen in quantum computers, in particular, Reedberg atom based quantum computers use something called the PXP model, projector X flip projector, and that PXP model is exactly rule one. That's a near Goldilocks rule, T14 near Goldilocks, but there is this rule T6, which says if I have a 0, 1 or a 1, 0, I do something on the local block sphere. Okay, and if I sequence that over the lattice in odd even, in odd even order in time, uh, then rather remarkable things happen. And I want to show you those remarkable things. And I'd like to um, uh, suggest that there may be some solitonic aspect to what is going on in that problem. OK, so what are the um, observables that we're dealing with? OK, so right now I'm going to use what's called a Hadamard gate. That flips a bit from the north uh, pole of the block sphere down to the equator. OK, and here's my even odd sequence. And these are called controlled, controlled Hadamard gates, or CCH gates. And I happen to be using 19 qubits to simulate, although I can do up to about 28 on a Google's quantum computer up to 54. OK, 
So to remind you, uh, you start with the density matrix, the outer product of the state with itself. You take a partial trace um, to get the density matrix for some you know, portion inside the system. That's your mixed subsystem. You then take an expectation value, and what you measure should be some analog of getting a 0 or a 1, as you would say, see in Conway's rule of life. OK, but it'll be a much richer problem. If I wanted to find the entropy of that subsystem, it looks just like the Gibbs entropy, sum over i, pi log pi, but now it's rho log rho, where you're placing the vector p uh, with the uh, matrix rho, the density matrix. Other than that, just like Gibbs entropy, it's called von Neumann entropy. And I'm in particular going to work with two-point measures. The reason I work with two-point measures is they encapsulate correlation. And correlation is what's interesting in this problem quantum mechanically. So I want to show this to you. This is my last slide of math here. So, um, OK, so again, I have the density matrix. I pull out a mixed state, just like I said, through a, through a partial trace, right? I now do that. Um, I now obtain the von Neumann entropy of that uh, single site. Um, and now I determine the mutual information, which is the entanglement of, draw this here. This is my lattice. This is J. This is K. So if I only measure J, I have some loss of information. That gives the entanglement with the whole system. If I only measure K, I have some loss of information. It's the entanglement with the whole system. If I measure J and K simultaneously, I still have loss of information. That's SJK. When I take SJ plus SK minus SJK, what's left is the entanglement between these two qubits. From that, I form an adjacency metric, which, which gives me a graph. Graph theory was mentioned earlier this morning. Okay. And to remind you, this is bounded from below by all two-point correlators in the system. OK. So uh, what do I actually observe? Right? So the first thing is I can say, what's the analog of my 0, 1? And here is um, this Goldilocks rule, T6. Here are some of the other rules out there. These are very late times. These are early times. And I'm doing a quantum circuit simulation. 19 qubits, here it is in time. Hopefully, everybody can see that there's lots of structure remaining in this Goldilocks rule, even at late times. Uh, in fact, something that you would never see classically is the quantum entropy. There is no really sort of entropy analog in that sense in regular cellular automata. And same thing, Goldilocks rule at very late times. You still have a lot of structure, a little bit in T1, certainly not in the other rules. How can we understand that? Visually, one of the best ways to understand two-point correlations, especially when they're structured, is to use graph theory, right, or network theory. OK, and so I'm going to use exactly the same kinds of measures as we use to understand complexity in the brain. Here's a 2009 neuroscience review, also using mutual information. For those of you who may have a quantum information background, here is a GHC state, GHC state which just got the Nobel Prize, actually. Um, here's a random state. And then here are all the states in between. And I'm showing you the graph of the mutual information produced by evolution in a quantum circuit. So far, this is all theory. Now, you notice that T6 has a lot of interesting persistence, persistence structure in it. T1 and T14, to some extent, and T13 looks pretty much random. OK. So if I try to now um, really, that was just a snapshot that I gave you. I try to really look at that data in, in, in you know, sort of large uh, over long times and lots of examples. What I'll find is if I look at all these different rules, if I look at, for example, the node strength and the probability density of that strength, uh, T6 really stands out. OK, what, what is this tail? Maybe some of you from graph theory will recognize this. Um, those, those, those are the well-connected hubs. That's the, the, the London, the, the New York, the Beijing, right? These are the um, well-connected hubs, and, uh, and they really stand out from all those other rules. So that formation of well-connected hubs is one of the first hallmarks of complexity. A second hallmark of complexity is large clustering. Uh, and clustering is basically its trace of the matrix cube, but it says, um, is the friend of my friend also my friend? It's that kind of idea. Here's some community formation. And you see that whether it's a function of system size or time, rule six always stays large in clustering. And finally, we can talk about other complexity measures. There are many. For example, disparity fluctuations tells me about rearrangements in the backbone of the system. And again, you know, this Goldilocks rule stays very high. OK. So you might say, well, that was a quantum circuit. What about continuous time? Aren't we interested in continuous time in this meeting? And the answer is, I mean, here are the simulations done in continuous time and discrete time. And you know, qualitatively, they're very, very similar. Complexity just stays the same. All the features are the same. Here's how I set up the problem. Because of time, I won't go too much into it. But if you want to ask me at the end, I'm happy to unpack it. I just have another uh, slide to show. And then I'm going to give you some mathematical problems that you may be interested in working on. So where is the soliton? 
Well, the solid ton is probably buried in some fashion that is not easily visible in the three site rule, but in the five site rule, it pops out, it's a smoking gun, and here it is. I would call this a quantum entangled breather. In fact, sort of provocatively, I, I put you know, a waveguide simulation right next to it, and what you can see is that if I start with the right initial condition and do the same kind of Goldilocks rule, but instead of nearest neighbors, I also use next nearest neighbors, then I produce something that is very, very solitonic. It's very hard to eliminate. You can put noise in the problem. It stays around. Uh, so it's indicating some kind of solitonic character. So we have persistent structure. We have complexity, right? And as soon as you go to next nearest neighbor rules, we have something that is visibly close to classical solitons. I think that's very interesting. OK. Experimentally, do these things happen? The answer is yes. The five site rule is a little tough for Google's quantum computer right now, but I can do the three site rule no problem. Um, it's a circuit that has about 12 pieces for each time step, so quantum circuits have a lot of overhead, and uh, it happens that you have to use post-selection, um, but in the end, you know, here's the uh, prediction, even with noise in the problem, now I'm putting noise in the problem, here's what you get in, in raw data, here's what you get when you post-select, and we're able to reproduce um, the predictions that I showed you of this Goldilocks rule. You know, of course, experiments are never as pretty as theory, as I think many people in the audience know, okay? And uh, m very importantly, if I look, for example, the clustering, a hallmark of complexity, and something that you know, is, I believe, being produced by a solitonic system, uh, if I look at this, this window where I'm sort of above background, where this green comes up and back down, I can see for different numbers of qubits, 15, 17, and 19, very importantly, the, the point in the circuit where I come back down to background is the same for different system sizes. So what does that mean? Well, that has really significant consequences for quantum computing, and I, I tried to put you know, uh, financial symbols for a number of nations around the world that have major quantum programs, okay? If the decoherence time is independent of the number of qubits, then we have a resource for error mitigation. Maybe not error correction, but error mitigation, which is on the steps toward the holy grail of quantum computing. Okay. So with that, um, I hope I've indicated to you that there is some kind of soliton quantumness scale going on that is beyond even what we're doing in this meeting, although this meeting is very lovely, right? And so, you know, we have seen mean field bright solitons in BCs. Peter, you, you, you may disagree, but I, I'm not sure if they're phase coherent or not. I mean, you, you, you can tell me if you believe they are at the end of the day, okay? Um, I think experiments might really be seeing these. It's very hard to tell the difference. Um, okay, the FAO experiments, for example, already showed quantum fluctuation supported mean field solitons. Uh, the weak interactions are clear for these strongly interacting solutions, limiting the solitons, the, the quantum flesh sewn in the classical bones that I mentioned, but the strong, strong interactions is an open puzzle. It's called, it's called a tongue de gas, okay? Non-classical states, there are early experiments by Shelby in the 1990s and many after, but as far as um, Schrodinger cats, that's still an open problem. Quantum correlated bright solitons, there are relatively new experiments from Randy Hewlett. They still don't differentiate, differentiate between the many theories trying to answer you know, what is really going on with strongly correlated bright solitons. And finally, um, I really have some nice experimental evidence that at least there's some kind of persistent complexity and error mitigation going on right, in a system that is generating something soliton-like on Google's quantum computer. OK, so I want to leave some open mathematical puzzles at the end. OK, the first is the following. Is there a generalization of the IST underneath the many appearances of quantum correlated and entangled solitons? The second is, what are the mathematical connections between solitons, quantum notions of integrability, emergence in both physical and computational quantum complexity? I believe I've showed you physical quantum complexity. If I had more time, I would indicate its connection to computational quantum complexity. Feel free to ask me. And then third, is there an effective dispersive fluid dynamical description for entangled quantum systems relevant for solitons? Mark, as per our conversation about quark on plasmas, this is a similar idea. There can be some effective description that's going on here. Okay? In particular, will dispersive shockwaves appear in entangled quantum systems? And might that be something that you could see, in fact, in a quantum circuit? With that, I thank you. Questions?
Yeah, th thanks, Lincoln, for a nice talk. Um, I, so in an attempt to answer some of these questions, I mean, what would you say is the best simple uh, quantum model uh, to work with to address these questions? Would you say the Lieb Linegar model is a good starting point or well, uh, something else? Lieb Linegar is, is a problem that I've solved pretty thoroughly as far as the um, you know, ground state solutions and the spectrum of excited states. I, I, I you know, it's, it's technically, it's not an integrable model, right? And so it would be one of these things where you try to show some effective description or universality. You know, as I, uh, Kennedy gave a nice talk about counting the number of solitons. And you know, there are a lot of ways of connecting it to things that are integrable. And then maybe having an analogous model that is integrable. And there are plenty of integrable many body quantum models out there that one can look at. But in fact, Lieblinger is pretty solvable. And, uh, and I have a list of solution methods in, in some of my work that people could use. They're all totally accessible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to remind everybody, the Lieb-Linegar model is interacting bosons in 1D on a line. Simple interaction, just contact, yeah. Good. Y you were so friendly. I, I hassled you so much about your talk. I was waiting for a really tough question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, so let's thank Lincoln again. And every speaker in this session. And I think uh, we have a tea now and poster session, and the lectures will resume tomorrow morning. <laughs>